Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. On October 26th of 2018, this defendant shot and killed two of his friends. He killed Christopher Thomas and Anthony Williams. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to set out the story and how this unfolded and lay out what I expect the evidence will show during the course of this trial. First thing you are going to hear is that at 4.35 a.m. on October 26th of 2018, Cortland Henry, the co-defendant, shows up at Memorial Miramar Hospital. In his car, he has two dead bodies. In the front passenger seat is Anthony Williams. In the rear passenger seat is Christopher Thomas. They are dead, they are riddled with bullets, and the car is full of blood. Christopher Thomas is sitting in the rear. There is multiple defects to his body. Anthony Williams, who is sitting in the front, has two major injuries. Officer Jessica Amangor is working a detail at the hospital. Cortland Henry runs in, starts telling a story about a drive-by. Quote, unquote, drive-by. Cortland Henry, and you're going to learn a lot about Miramar geography during the course of this trial, tells a story that he and his buddies, just the two that are in the car, were at a music studio here in downtown Fort Lauderdale at 805 Northeast 4th Avenue. He's going to tell law enforcement, and you're going to hear this statement, you're going to hear the actual audio of him telling law enforcement, we were at the recording studio, we drove home, because they lived out in West Miramar. You're gonna hear Cortland say that they come across in the path of travel, that they're getting off the highway on I-75 southbound to go west on Miramar Parkway. And you're gonna hear that on Miramar Parkway, sometime between 160th, which is also commonly referred to as Dykes Road, and 172nd, Cortland Henry says they were shot at. That he ducked down, and you'll see him doing that in the video, and that he didn't see any car, he didn't see any people, he has no information. And that he quickly went to the nearest hospital. So you're gonna learn that when you go on Miramar Parkway, and you take that right at 172, Memorial Miramar is just about one mile north. So the distance between most major intersections in Broward County is one mile. So you're going to learn that from 160th to 172nd, one mile. From 172nd to the next major intersection on Miramar Parkway, 184th, one mile. So you're going to hear and find that the, Mr. Henry's statement that the car is traveling westbound on Memorial Parkway then goes north on 172nd and shows up at the hospital for the drive-by is completely and utterly false. How can I tell you that, ladies and gentlemen? Well, the detectives from Miramar at this point shut down the entire length of Miramar Parkway from 160th to 172nd. And they sit and they walk side by side for an hour that mile long stretch, looking for evidence of this drive-by. Because evidence is the remnants a crime leaves behind. And in this case, the lack of evidence is very important. There is a lack of any evidence whatsoever to support that a drive-by happened on Miramar Parkway. What would they look for? Shell casings. Glass fragments, projectiles, tire marks. You're going to hear that there is none of that found whatsoever. So then they said, well, maybe we have the time frame wrong. Maybe we have the location wrong. So they walk an additional mile from 172 to 184th. Still nothing. No broken glass. No projectiles, no fire casings. Detectives know they have a Jeep that they are looking at at the Memorial Miramar Hospital that has 16 
easily identifiable bullet defects that has a broken out rear view window and two broken side windows on the passenger side. Things aren't adding up. So detectives work backwards. They are then able to determine that 805 Northeast 4th address, that it's a recording studio, and that the recording studio is equipped with cameras. And ladies and gentlemen, you're going to see footage from both inside and outside of that recording studio. You're gonna learn that on the morning of the 26th at approximately 1 p.m., detectives went out to the recording studio to try and see if somebody had followed the victims to find out how they knew where they were going to be to set up this drive-by. In the video, that is the first time detectives learned that there was actually four people in that gray Jeep and that the defendant, Jamel Demons, is in the rear driver's side seat. So let me set the scene for you at the recording studio because there's actually eight young men there. You're gonna hear they arrived at the recording studio, not much was getting done. They were tired. They left at 319, and they got into two vehicles. So first vehicle is a red Mitsubishi SUV. In that red Mitsubishi SUV, four individuals get into it. Trevion Glass, Dontavius Withers, Jacoby Mills, and Adrian Davis. They are in the red Mitsubishi. In the gray Jeep, you have the driver, Portland Henry, rear driver's side passenger, Jamel Demons, Anthony Williams in the front seat, and Cortland Henry again, the driver, Christopher Thomas in the rear. What you will find and what you will hear, ladies and gentlemen, is that this gray Jeep leaves the recording studio, goes over to I-95, takes I-95 south to 595, 595 across to I-75 south, I-75 south to Miramar Parkway. You're gonna see tra traffic cameras from the Department of Transportation that show the cars going across 595, one after the other. In those videos, you're not gonna see them stop. And it's just a, a small portion of which is covered by cameras on that. But then what you're going to see is the cell phone evidence. The digital leash. The item that is carried around in everyone's pocket, in everyone's car, you use on a daily basis. Because you're going to see, as Janelle Demons leaves that recording studio, he's got his phone in his hand, and he's playing on his phone. You're going to see on that phone information that Anthony Williams had this phone with him. And the interesting fact that's important to keep in mind is Anthony Williams, the deceased in the front passenger seat, and Jamel Demons, who is the shooter, in the rear driver's side passenger seat, have the exact same make and model of cell phone. Not only do they have the same make and model of cell phone, they are on the exact same cell phone plan. They're using the same service, the same cell towers, everything like that. So you can compare the information from those two cell phones and see how they track together. Christopher Thomas, who's the deceased in the rear passenger seat, he had his iPhone as well and he was on the Sprint service at the time. In the other car, that red Mitsubishi, Dontavious Withers also had a Sprint service cell phone. So ladies and gentlemen, you have individuals in two cars and all of the cell phone tracks together. Going across 595, going until they get to Miramar Parkway and 184th. At 184th, the red Mitsubishi goes south. 
and you will then see it at 3.50 a.m. going through the guard gate at Sunset Lakes. That was the gated community in which the individuals were all living at the time of this homicide in October of 2018. On the Sunset Lakes guard video, the red Mitsubishi goes through, the gray Jeep doesn't. The gray Jeep instead goes north and then proceeds to go to the actual scene of the homicides. The gray Jeep goes north on 184th up to Pines Boulevard. From Pines Boulevard, it travels west all the way to the edge of the Everglades, where it is desolate, where it is dark, where there are no witnesses. The gray Jeep goes down south on US 27 and turns left on Pembroke Road. You're gonna learn that Pembroke Road does not connect through. That right there, Pembroke Road dead ends at a trash facility. That at that recycling facility, you're not going to see people. You're not going to see activity. There's no street lights. And at 4.02 a.m., Jamel Demons exits that vehicle and stages that drive -by. Because ladies and gentlemen, remember, at this time, Miramar is going and working backwards. They're looking for communication to figure out how and why and how the location of this Jeep was known why they would be targeted. At that point, there is no communication. You're not going to see any sort of phone calls, any sort of text messages going out, setting up any sort of meeting at the edge of the Everglades at four in the morning. What you are going to find is that after the surveillance footage is brought up, some of these other individuals say, oh no, we stopped. We stopped the car and Mr. Demons on the side of the highway got out of the gray Jeep and got into the red Mitsubishi. But ladies and gentlemen, it's important to know and look at the details because the details don't match up. One person says, oh, it's at this location. One person says it's over here on the side of the road. Look at what the physical evidence shows, and that's what I would suggest to you as the most reliable things. So on the physical evidence, the Jeep is towed to the Miramar substation, and a search warrant is executed on it. And at that point, officers, crime scene technicians, and investigators start going through the contents of the Jeep. And all of the ballistic from the drive-by are all coming from the passenger side in towards the driver's side. And then from the rear of the vehicle forwards towards the front. The medical examiner's office is also conducting an investigation. You're gonna hear testimony about the autopsies that were conducted on Anthony Williams and Christopher Thomas. And this is when the suspicion, the investigation takes a turn. Because at that point, the fatal wounds for Christopher Thomas and Anthony Williams are coming from inside the vehicle, from the rear driver's side passenger, going out towards the passenger side. The other interesting thing the medical examiner's office is going to tell you is that when the drive-by was staged at 4.02 a.m., the victims were already dead. The medical examiner will be able to testify and tell you that the fatal shots to Anthony Williams, to his head, that enters in the back of his head and exits at the top, blowing out the front passenger window, was fatal. And that the additional wounds that are consistent with the trajectories going through the vehicle, he was already dead there is a post-mortem inflicted gunshot wounds. The same for Christopher Thomas. You will hear from the medical examiners, the Dr. McDougall and Dr. Souter, who conducted the autopsies, that Christopher Thomas was shot in his left cheek. That was the fatal shot for him. You're also gonna hear about stippling. Stippling is 
unburnt gunpowder that's ejected from the front of a firearm when a bullet is fired. The best way to describe that and make it easy to understand, if you have a handful of sand, soot, and a golf ball. If you throw it, the golf ball is going to go the furthest because it has the most weight, the most mass. The sand weighs a little bit more than the soot, so it's going to go a little bit further, but not as far as the golf ball. The ash, the soot, which has almost no weight, no mass, therefore it can't have any energy put into it, falls very quickly. So that is the same principle that comes to gunshot residue and the powder tattooing that you're going to hear about, the stippling. The bullet travels the furthest. The gunshot residue, the powder tattooing, the stippling, creates a pattern. And from that pattern, the medical examiner's office can give an approximate distance. Why can they not give an exact one? Because their firearm in this case was never recovered. Law enforcement made diligent efforts to go and dive multiple canals, search multiple areas, apartments, storage units. They were never able to find the firearm. So without the actual firearm that was used in this case, you can't accurately and reliably recreate a distance determination. Common sense, ladies and gentlemen, the things that you learned in elementary school science about conducting science experiments, they apply just as much now as they did then. You have to minimize the number of variables. That's the only way to get an accurate experiment. So if you don't know, the type of gun, you can't minimize the variables to get that distance determination. So what you're also going to hear is while law enforcement is going through that Jeep, they find one spent shell casing for a 40 caliber firearm. Why is that important? That shows a gun was fired inside of that car. You're going to hear that at once the location of US 27 and Pembroke Road was discovered, law enforcement goes out to that area as well. And there they locate an additional eight shell casings, 40 caliber, but the interesting thing about that is that doesn't happen on October 26th of 2018. This happens on November 21st, almost a month later. Because that's when law enforcement gets the reliable cell phone tracking data that they use to determine that's the area that they need to be searching. Because at that location is where the cell phones of Christopher Thomas, Anthony Williams, and Jamel Demons all line up at 4.02 a.m. That point, afterwards, Mr. Demons' phone tracks with the two victims until about 4.20. So 15 minutes before Portland Henry takes the victims to the hospital. During those 30 minutes, you're going to hear as to where the path went. You're going to hear that law enforcement then searched that path again looking for trace evidence, such as firearms. They didn't find it. But you're also going to hear that Jamel Demons, on the side of the road, made a FaceTime video chat. At that point, he starts setting up the story. He FaceTimes his girlfriend at the time, Mariah Hamilton. Mariah Hamilton gets the phone call and screams, waking up her mother, Felicia Holmes. Felicia Holmes also sees the defendant, Jamel Demons, on that FaceTime video call. And you're gonna learn, ladies and gentlemen, that that's a data event on a cell phone. That a, it's not a call for the purposes of the cell phone companies. It's using data, accessing the internet. Felicia Holmes and Mariah Hamilton see Jamel Demons outside and he is saying he's just been involved in a drive-by and he thinks Anthony Williams and Chris Thomas are dead. 
So what you're also going to find out is while Mr. Demons is out there on the side of the road, 4 in the morning, 442 specifically, he sends a drop pin, digital homing beacon, to his current location to one of his friends, Frederick Gibbons. Frederick Gibbons is also involved in the music industry, and he asked to be picked up. Frederick Gibbons, then about 11 minutes later, is sent another drop pin where Mr. Demons has moved a couple of meters. What you're going to find out as well, though, is these digital leashes, they have more than just phone calls, accessing the internet. They have health data. So ladies and gentlemen, you're going to find and hear and be able to see the videos at the recording studio and see Mr. Demons taking steps. Lo and behold, look at the health activity data, a pedometer, a step counter, that's what it is. 70 steps. Then you're gonna see at 4.02 a.m. another 70 steps. Then at 4.42, the time frame in which he's sending that drop pin to 4.53 a.m., you're gonna see 1,397 steps. You will see this data showing the defendant had the phone and was using it. So ladies and gentlemen, one of the things that I have to prove is the defendant committed a crime. And to do that, the state intends to show the evidence that the phone was there at the murder scene and there were no other phones there. There is no one else out there at four in the morning. So to do that, the state has to convince each and every one of you that this was the phone of the defendant. You'll see in the messages and the contents of those messages, him identifying himself. This is now giving out that phone number to multiple people as being his phone number. 772-713-9807. And to further prove that, the state is going to show you the Instagram, the Facebook, the Snapchat. Because contrary to popular belief, Snapchat doesn't disappear. And detectives were able to write a search warrant and get contents of Snapchat. And there are things that are there and there are things that are not. And so ladies and gentlemen, specifically, the Instagram, the defendant during the course of the months of October of 2018 through December of 2018, gives out his phone number 15 times. Says, this is me, and all during the same time frame of October 26th of 2018, he's giving out that phone number. So one of the other elements that you heard about initially was that this was committed by a criminal gang member in furtherance of a criminal gang. So what you will learn from the evidence, from the Instagram, from the private messages, was that Jamel Demons is a member of the G Shine Blood Set. This is not a stage personality. This is not an actor that's playing a character. This was his real life. Ladies and gentlemen, you will see that as soon as October 24th, two days before the homicide, Jamel Demons is learning the oath of loyalty to the G-Shine blood set. You're going to see things in these messages that will be indicative of blood membership. For example, any time a word would normally be spelled with a C, as in Charlie, they don't use that. They replace it with the letter B. So instead of saying, I'm at the crib, they say, I'm at the rib. Why, ladies and gentlemen? Because C is associated with cribs. B is for bloods. So if you look through all the messages, you will notice time and time again, Jamel Demons is dropping C's and using B's. And you're gonna see, 
pictures. You're going to see videos of the defendant doing something called stacking, which is a way to show a gang affiliation and to broadcast it to the world. And this is not just in music videos. This is not just in lyrics. Because we're not going to get into that. That's artistic expression. That's not why we are here today. We are here because the defendant murdered two individuals. So in summary, the last thing I want to tell you that the evidence will show is that in the Instagram, because the defendant had a moderate social media following at the time of these <coughs> events, people are reaching out to him. Some fans, some friends, some associates. You'll see on October 26th, after about 8 a.m. in the morning, Eastern time, multiple messages are coming in. Messages are coming in from individuals checking to see if he's okay, if he's been injured in this drive-by. If it's true that Anthony Williams, who's also sometimes referred to as SAC, and Chris Thomas, who is referred to as Juby, are really dead. One individual, and specifically, sends out, and I want to quote the message exactly that you will hear, and says, right after this, yo, homie, you good? Let me know something. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this is where context matters. What does that mean? If you work at Google and you say, my whole floor is coding, that's a good thing. If you work at Broward General Hospital and you say, my whole floor is coding, that is a bad thing. The context around the messages matters. So in the context of this message, this individual is reaching out, asking if Mr. Demons is good after he's been tagged in multiple social media posts about this drive through, this shooting. And Mr. Demons responds very succinctly I did that. Shh. Ladies and gentlemen, at the conclusion of the evidence, the state is confident that you will find the defendant guilty as charged of the first degree murder of Christopher Thomas and Anthony Williams. Thank you. Counsel, thank you.